All right. Thank you everybody for joining us today for this third and final panel during our iWeek Innovation Week here at Unimed. We are the Technology Transfer Office for the Nebraska Medical Center as well as the UNO campus. My name is Dr. Metz Crawford. I will be hosting and facilitating your questions today. We have a great crew of panelists joining us today with a very diverse amount of expertise. Um, so as we go through, if you have questions, go ahead, throw them in the chat, we'll ask the panelists. Just tell me who you're asking the question to, um, or if it's to the entire panel, and we will get your questions answered. Um, also to our panelists, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. So I think what we'll do is just go ahead, dive into it. I want to know from each of the panelists, what expertise or skill does an inventor need to have in order to work with you? Um, so let's start with Dr. Barnum. Uh, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. I'm, I'm Megan from BBC. Um, so what skills or, or expertise does an inventor need to work with us? Um, I mean, so our company specializes in SBIR and STTR proposal prep. Um, so first and foremost, you don't have to have expertise in SBIR to come and work with us because that's what, what we do here and we try to provide that expertise for you. Um, but otherwise, I mean, the expertise you need, um, if you're going to be the one writing the proposal, it helps to have expertise in whatever technology area you're developing or what you're trying to fund. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have all the expertise you need, um, make sure that you have other people on your team you can go to for that expertise. So it always takes a well-rounded team, but make sure whoever's writing the proposal at least can uh, put together the scientific part really strongly. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. Um, Dr. Gatzmeyer from Unitech. I think, let's see, what, what does an inventor need to have to work with Unitech? Well, I'd say you can have <clears throat> really specific interest in doing research and development in a, an innovative area. If you want to develop some technology, we can help you get that done. On the other hand, if you have motivation to own a small business and be an entrepreneur, uh, we can also help you with that. Uh, if those two things, if you are those two things at once, awesome. Uh, you're a perfect fit. Come talk to Unitech. Um, yeah, I would say you really just need uh, to have the passion for, uh, you know, trying to start a small business based on some sort of innovative technology and uh, you're in. <laughs> So how would those pathways look different for your two type of inventors? Well, it really has to do with, um, I suppose, where you, what your position is in the community. If you're a faculty member at the university, that looks a lot different than if you are just um, someone who's out there in the business world trying to be an entrepreneur. If you are the former, um, what we want to help you do is get... Um, the kind of business expertise you're going to need to actually just do basic stuff like register a business with the state or um, do things like file an SBIR proposal or whatever it might be um, on the more commercialization side. You may be an expert in, um, you know, new forms of batteries, but we are the experts in getting a small business running. So we can help you there. If on the other hand, you're an entrepreneur who really is passionate about small business and um, trying to develop some sort of uh, innovative new startup, you can come and see what projects are like the, uh, you know, those previous, those first ones where we have sort of an inventor who's got some sort of technology who's maybe invested in the research and not so much in the business side of things. And we can help partner entrepreneurs with, um, you know, with projects. So there may be someone who wants to build a new heart valve and we need someone who wants to run that startup, um, even if you don't know anything about heart valves. So those are two different pathways. One really um, is more of a taking tech transfer to the next step, trying to get that, that intellectual property to be a small business. And the other one involves linking you up with some project that's already sort of going along. Perfect, thanks for the clarification, Jace. All right, we have Josh Nickel Caddy with us. He's the Technology Commercialization Director at Nebraska Business Development Center. Same question to you, Josh. When do people engage with you? Um, 
really it runs the gamut. I think we have people who engage at just like the very earliest stage of I have an interesting idea and I want to talk it through um, uh, to someone who's, you know, got a minimum viable product or a working prototype. And um, they are, again, curious about like what their what their next steps are. So we have what technology readiness levels of, of various types. And so uh, uh, our office really focuses on then the commercialization piece of that to, to what Jace mentioned there as well, is just kind of talking through what's the, 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 the market research, um, maybe conducting some customer discovery or some interviews there to just try and figure out where do, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Some, uh, some, in some cases that will require more, more you know, laboratory research and so there are funding mechanisms for that and talking through those options there. Or is it, you know, kind of spinning it out, forming a startup um, uh, or partnering with someone to, to do that, to found a, a business and, and try and get it more into the, um, into the marketplace. Um, so uh, I, really it, it takes all kinds. I mean, like it's really what, what the goals of that individual researcher are. Um, and what kind of fits with the technology that you're that you're working with? Maybe there isn't a, a ton of commercial potential, um, but it, it's still an interesting concept. That doesn't mean you wouldn't you know want to fund it or pursue it anymore. It just means that it, it's going to be a little bit more niche, and that's going to be a different set of action items than than one that you know has this huge upside, uh, scalable potential. I guess. Um, and the I guess the other part I wanted to add here as well. Um, I know there are a lot of um, researchers on, on the line here, but uh, industry experience, kind of knowledge of that of the, of the marketplace that you seek to enter, um, the, the applicability of that, of that research uh, is also really important. So I, I think having that science piece there, um, finding a co-founder or something that has industry knowledge, um, obviously if you're, especially in the life sciences, you have a I'm sure tons of knowledge about about the industry that you're working in as well, healthcare and, and medical and the medical field and things. So in that way, it's a really excellent opportunity. This one uh, uh, to speak here because you do have a lot of people who who you know kind of know know the industry and and know kind of the the paths for um, for commercialization. Where do, where does this idea go um, to enter the marketplace? But I think that industry knowledge is is paramount. Uh, to making sure that uh, these ideas are, you know, uh, have uh, have the longest legs possible. You know, that these, these projects can uh, have funding beyond uh, the grants or whatever that kind of get them started. Excellent. So what would you say to an inventor who comes in with an idea but really doesn't know the industry space? And if you would like to defer to Joy, I know Joy would have a few things to say on the topic. I'm deferring to Joy, actually. So okay. thanks. <laughs> Um, so Joy is our entrepreneurship program manager at New Tech Ventures. Go ahead and kick it over to you, Joy. What do you think? Thanks, AJ. Yes, yeah, so for those who don't know, New Tech Ventures is um, basically the sister office to AJ's office, um, but we're located on the Lincoln campus. And so we serve um, researchers um, at UNL and UNK. So um, people who want to disclose an invention on those campuses can come to New Tech rather than Unimed, but we do also have some services that are open a little more broadly, which is why AJ invited me today. And one of those, which I'm guessing maybe Josh would like me to mention is um, we do some customer discovery training. And so I think if, if you were lacking in a little bit of that industry knowledge, you could come and do a program called Nebraska Introduction to Customer Discovery. Um, and that's a free six week program that we offer a couple of times throughout the year. And it's open to anyone in the university system. And it's, it's a structured program that's based on NSF i um, the National Teams Program. And it just helps researchers who have maybe a very, very early stage idea, or maybe they've already founded a company and they want to do some early stage customer discovery and really hone their value proposition, figure out a little bit more about their customer segmentation. And I guess relevant to this question here is really explore that ecosystem. Um, and learn more about relevant stakeholders, that's a piece where we could really help in this situation. So if you don't feel you have the industry knowledge that you know you need to have, this is the type of program that could help you by just getting out of the building and talking to people. They could be potential customers, they could be potential competitors, they could be um, people in the regulatory space that's relevant to your um, industry. Um, just all, all will help you think of all different kinds of people that you need to talk to who 
who can help give you insights um, into your potential business ideas. So that introduction to customer discovery program, like I said, is open to everyone in the system. And um, we would love to have more people involved. We just kicked off a cohort um, this week. So <laughs> it'll be a few months before uh, spaces are open again, but we, we welcome everyone. So Joy, if I'm a um, entrepreneur or new inventor on this call listening in, and I'm hearing you talk about this customer discovery program that's available, but I have a product and I know who my customer is. So what's customer discovery gonna do for me? Yeah, that's a great question. And we do have a lot of people participate who are already at that stage. You've already developed a product or service um, and that's okay too, because <laughs> we actually had a really great example of a company that was established and they wanted to expand their market. And so they were serving one market already and they were hoping to branch out a little bit. So they applied the customer discovery mindset as though they were coming at it. They were looking at a new market vertical of entering out of a sports arena into the military arena. And how could they come at it as though they were starting from scratch, looking at a whole new um, vertical and talking to those people um, as though they were just starting fresh with new eyes. And that was really valuable for them because they realized a lot of the terminology they used in the sports space didn't apply in the military space. It was actually a turnoff for those potential customers. And so you can apply the methodology, um, the curiosity that you have to bring to this, the openness um, and willingness to receive feedback from your stakeholders and from the instructional team. All of it's really relevant, um, even if you've already established your business or you've, you've created your product or service already. And um, you just want to you know, hone that down a little bit more. Awesome. That sounds, that sounds really helpful. I hope people are taking advantage of that opportunity. Thanks, Joy. And then finally, we have the opportunity. Our last panelist on here um, is a little separated from academia. Um, he is the program director for Invest Nebraska. Matt, what, what stage, what expertise do people need before they engage with you? Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for having me on. My name is Matt Foley. I help out with the Invest Nebraska team. Invest Nebraska, we are a venture development fund. So we invest in early stage startup companies. Um, so we invest in a variety of medical device and life science companies, but also a lot of B2B SaaS, um, IT, hardware, really all across the gamut, we're industry agnostic. Um, as far as the right time to engage Invest Nebraska, we like to tell people there really isn't a wrong time. Um, we'll take a meeting with anybody. We try to sit down, see how we can help. A lot of our work is education. So we're sitting down with an entrepreneur or a potential future entrepreneur and letting them know the state resources. A lot of the outcomes of our meeting is maybe you don't actually want to raise investment, you should go after a grant. So the SBIR that Josh talked about or the Nebraska prototype grant. But as far as what it looks like to engage Invest Nebraska from an investment perspective, um, I would echo something that Jay said is there's a personal passion. We invest in entrepreneurs that are working on their venture full time or upon investment, they will work on their venture full time. So if this wants to be a side hustle or a side project for you, that's great. There's a lot of amazing side hustles going across the state of Nebraska, but that's probably not something you should raise venture capital for. So we're looking for teams or solo founders that are going to be solely focused on their venture. And as far as this conversation, something that um, around technology or proprietary technology, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be patented, but there needs to be some sort of defensible moat that can separate it from the market. <clears throat> Perfect, that seg segues me into exactly my next question. I want the panelists, if you could, if you could describe kind of a typical project that you would work with um, and what the deliverables then at the end of that project would look like for somebody. Um, Megan, I think it's a little intuitive what your deliverable is, but if you wanna talk about that, that'd be great. Um, sure. So, so we work with a lot of people who are, you know, new entrepreneurs or early stage startups who've never applied for SBIR funding before. And we've also worked with people who have gotten SBIR funding, but maybe they're going to a new agency that they're not familiar with, or, you know, maybe they're going for their first phase two. Um, so our, our typical project really runs the gamut. Um, and we work with all, you know, we prepare, help prepare proposals for all 11 agencies that have an SBIR program for a variety of different technology areas. Um, so each project is a little bit different, um, but the process is generally the same. You, you come in and you have a, an initial conversation with BBC and we kind of help you assess where you are. What do you need to be competitive in your proposal? What are you missing? Um, you know, what are some things you need to be thinking about? Is this something you have time to do? 
Um, and then once we get past that, um, and when you start to work with us, you'll be paired one on one with a consultant who's going to kind of hold your hand and guide you through the SBIR proposal prep process. And we're, we'll help you through everything from the registration to the proposal prep all the way to submission, um, help you uh, help answer your questions, help you um, prepare your proposal in terms of providing templates or outlines for each component you have to prepare. We'll provide uh, feedback on those proposals. So if you want to send us a draft of something, you can send it to your consultant and they're going to provide really thorough feedback on it, kind of looking, looking at it through the reviewer's eyes. Um, and kind of do an iterative feedback process until you feel you have something that's you know as competitive as as you can make it. Um, and the deliverables, yeah, I mean, at the end, we're our goal is to help you meet your deadline um, and getting your proposal in when you want it to get in. Um, and if if you don't get it funded that time, we're here to help you get it on a resubmission. Um, so that's kind of our our deliverables. You know, you start working with us, and we're going to help you put together something that you're proud of. Excellent. So if I, and I imagine it's a spectrum, but if I'm a first time inventor and I've never really approached the SBIR or STTR space, what kind of timeline can I expect for this? Is this something I can start three months before a funding deadline or it needs a year? Um, yeah, I mean, our recommendation is three months. Um, at, give yourself at least three months to put something together um, because it really does take a lot of time and effort. Um, and the three month timeline gives you enough time to address any weaknesses that you might have, you know, in your team or in your project proposal, you know, helping you put together your budget and getting all the materials for that. It takes a long time um, and sometimes you don't see it until it's too late. So three months is a good starting point. Um, we've seen people come in last minute and it just it's always a scramble and mad dash to the to the finish line. So try to give yourself a good good runway there with three months at least. Good to know. Thank you, Megan. All right, Jace, I know Unitech has a lot of deliverables. Hey, you know, we we just do a lot of stuff, so uh, it's not quite as focused on uh, deliverables. You know, the deliverable is a, is a startup that, that's out in the world selling its thing. It, something has gone from bench to bedside. That's the deliverable. Um, no, I want to emphasize what Megan uh, said about uh, giving yourself plenty of time because I think uh, uh, people tend to look at the SBIR, STTR program and say, oh, you know, great money from uh, the federal government, uh, you know, right there for the taking, but it is quite a process and it, it is complicated and takes quite a while. So give yourself lots of time, set some deadlines and work with someone who knows the program already who can answer questions because Otherwise, you're going to have to wade through a lot of instructions. Um, as, as far as what kind of projects Unitech in general works with, um, we are, you know, Unitech offers a range of services from just providing startups with office space at, or, um, you know, prototyping to, um, you know, providing, you know, business uh, strategy. Um, registering businesses in various ways. Um, so there's a whole range of things that Unitech as an entrepreneurial startup organization can offer as well as an, an incubator. Uh, for me personally, as the innovation development strategist at Unitech, um, that role basically means that I am helping researchers and entrepreneurs who are at the stage of needing funding to get their thing a little further developed. So if it's not at a stage quite yet where um, investors can say, you know, if an investor looks at what you're working on and says, you know what, come back when you've got a working prototype, that's when you talk to me and I can help you get that funding to develop that, whether it comes from the university, you know, the NIH, um, any number of, whether I can help you get into an accelerator, um, you know, I've, I'm working with some companies right now going through an accelerator out of the University of Missouri that, um, you know, not only coaches, uh, you know, researchers, but also helps them uh, get funding to take that, uh, to do a little development of what they're working on. So, yeah, Unitech has a whole bunch of stuff and you need to, if you want to get our help, just come tell us where you're at. And if you uh, need to get over the over the hump and get yourself something that uh, 
that actually uh, works and can be tested, then uh, I can help you get there. Fantastic. All right, Josh, same question. What does what does a typical project that you work with look like and what are your deliverables? Okay, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a step back um, only because um, we are co-located with the Small Business Development Center um, as well as the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And um, that's a lot of acronyms uh, for those who are un unaffiliated. So I guess I would just say that, um, you know, kind of our roots with both the FAST grant and the Small Business Development Center are with the Small Business Administration. And those are most famous for, um, you know, the loan guarantee program. And what I really appreciate about kind of the Small Business Development Center, Nebraska Business Development Center um, concept is that there's a little bit of um, client advocacy on that piece is that like if, you know, you have a government agency whose job is to guarantee loans, um, the idea is that you need to move a lot of product, you need to move a lot of loans through through the pipeline, right? And the idea with the small business is the client advocacy piece, the development center there to then say, maybe a loan's not appropriate in this case. And what are the other ways that we can help you um, you know, start small and scale up? Is there a way to bootstrap this? You don't need to start a restaurant straight from scratch with a huge capital improvements loan or whatever. Is there a way you can start a comp uh, catering company, do that proof of concept, and then figure out that, oh, I need, an in I need a location and it needs to be here. So that's kind of what I apply then to the fact that the FAST program, the, uh, the innovation arm of the SBDC takes a very similar approach, which is just like, what is the appropriate on-ramp for off-ramp for you? What are your goals? It is your business. It's your project ultimately. So I have metrics, obviously, um, as everybody does. And, you know, those are, those are mandated for me to receive the, the grant funding to run this program. Um, I have very clear deliverables, um, much like others on the call, you know, kind of SBIRs and things like that. But um, the tension with that also is to say, what, I mean, but what are, what are your goals? What, what, what fits the ecosystem best? Um, what, um, what does a, a satisfactory outcome kind of look like? And I, I mean, and that changes a lot also. So I think there's, um, you know, kind of that standard intake meeting. Sometimes people just need help with the, um, the registrations piece so that they can get entered into the system for award management, call it good, cool, case closed, done. Um, uh, maybe they, you know, had an unsuccessful SBIR last, you know, six months ago and they want to resubmit. And then there's some edits, some reviews, resubmit, and then that's, that's an interesting case also. Um, and then there are a lot of inventors that come our way um, where you're not exactly sure where they fit. And it's really frustrating because there are, you know, myriad um, options for them. And it's finding the one that, that they're satisfied with. Um, and therefore, I'm, you know, I'll have to be satisfied with, even if it doesn't help me meet the goals that I set for myself, um, which stinks because um, I don't get to enter those in my Excel document that I send to SBA. Um, but that, uh, but that's ultimately kind of what what the job is there. So I I have you know kind of deliverables, but I, I think sometimes it's uh, it's kind of a messy question. AJ, I'm sorry, or that answer is not really all that great. But that is kind of um, you know from where I sit the job. No, that's that's a great answer. And then I'm curious to so this inventor who kind of doesn't fit the mold for anything else, what, what kind of situation would that be? And how does that resolve? <laughs> it's a really frustrating one, honestly. Um, I'm not, you know, it's it's different every time. I mean, I think there are um, uh, there are smaller, you know, kind of loan loan funds and programs uh, that they can they can access. Uh, but I have, you know, like a mental Rolodex of then founders that that I, I uh, I just reached out to someone this week where uh, two years ago when they approached me about an idea, there, there wasn't a solicitation for it. It just kind of, you know, got kind of mired a little bit. And then um, a solicitation comes out or you meet another founder or another entrepreneur or a researcher or something that could be matched up. And two years sounds like is, is a really long time. I'd be, I'd be frustrated as well, but it's, um, uh, they were incredibly grateful, you know, to, to then 
say like, well, can I make this connection now? Uh, so uh, that, so I don't know. The, so I don't have a great answer for you. Sometimes we can make the appropriate connection. There's a mentor relationship or something that can be brokered and that can really happen. And other times, um, you know, if, if funding is really what's needed, uh, you know, we, you do the best you can to find the, the grant program, the, the, the loan potential, um, maybe, you know, uh, private funding or something like that, that just gets it moving in some kind of incremental way. Definitely. I think, I think you touched on an important point that innovators have to keep in mind, which is the people who manage innovation are constantly managing innovation. So a lot of times there's not a right mold and not a right fit for what the next steps are. So we're all kind of always learning together, using each other's resources um, and really that kind of back and forth, building out new programs because we had that instance where something could have been useful um, or somebody else had a resource that we didn't. So I, I think it's important that when people approach the people managing innovation, you're gonna break our mold every single time. So that's all right. All right, Joy. The one thing I love about my job is I don't, I don't think that any two days are ever the same. And so to answer what's a typical project like is kind of difficult. I think um, in general, much like the Unimed office, you know, working in a tech transfer office, um, we work with all different kinds of projects. Um, so on the UNL campus, you know, we see innovations coming from pretty much any, any department you can imagine. Uh, we see a lot, especially in the ag space and the engineering space, obviously, um, probably two of our stronger areas and also food science. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on there right now, which is great. Um, so it's kind of a really rough idea. Um, but in terms of deliverables, I guess that might be a little bit easier to answer. Um, anytime that we can see an innovation go from the lab to the marketplace, that's considered a win. So, you know, whatever form that may take, um, whether that's through like a traditional licensing deal that a, a tech transfer office does, you know, that's great. Um, or if we work with those um, campus researchers who want to start, you know, their own company. Um, you know, that's the side of the house I'm working on on the entrepreneurship side. And that's for me even more exciting. <laughs> so um, deliverables, but though can also be a lot smaller things. So within the customer discovery program I talked about earlier, it can be seeing, you know, the little baby steps um, of a team realizing that they had a wrong assumption and they talked to some potential customers and then they pivoted and changed their idea uh, to meet um, stakeholder needs. You know, that's a win in my mind. And, and so the deliverable is that they took a step in a different direction and they saved themselves time and money and heartache uh, and didn't build something that nobody wanted. So um, the deliverables are sometimes really big, but sometimes um, for me, just seeing progress that people make, that's, that's a success in my eyes, even if it's not like a concrete deliverable. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that. All right, as a reminder to the audience, let us know your questions. You can add any questions into the chat and we will get them answered. Um, back to Matt, I'm wondering, um, you've touched on it. I think just about every panelist has touched on it. How important is mentoring during a startup process and how and where do people find these good fits? That's a great question. I mean, it goes a long ways. I think a lot of times the entrepreneurs that I'm most impressed with are the ones that are constantly looking for active advisors and people that can open doors for them, but there's no magic formula for that. Um, the good news is in Nebraska, a lot of people are much more generous with their time. And this is kind of just true, broadly speaking for the Midwest. Um, almost anyone that has at one point in their career been in the founder's shoes understands how tough it is to get going and they're willing to give back. Um, so that would be one area is, is looking for, for the repeat founders or people that previously started a company. Um, and then secondly, I think understanding what, what are the interests and what are the specific wings or divisions of large corporations and who are the advantage points or who are the point of contacts that might be willing to give an hour or two out of their day and they can tell their boss and it's a win for their day. So there's a lot of big corporations, for example, in, in the ag or biotech industry and they have front facing venture arm and also new business and R&D units. And that's part of their job description is go out be a tech scout essentially and understand what's on the cutting edge. Um, so honestly, just doing some digging on LinkedIn and you're much more likely to get a response on a cold message to one of those folks um, because it's it's part of their job description. 
Excellent. And what uh, what job titles, if people are hunting through LinkedIn, what are they looking for in these people? Yeah, so if, if a company has an actual venture arm, a lot of times it'll be um, head of new ventures or director of venture investing. Um, really, honestly, anything around new venture R&D or startup, I mean, sometimes they have innovation managers. Um, a lot of big companies have an innovation team. So they're actually going to be looking for, for folks like the people on this call. So um, at the very least, if it's not that person, they can probably point in the right direction. That's really good to know. Appreciate it. All right, Megan, what have you found in mentorship and making connections? How, how do people find good mentor fits? Oh man, well, that's always the tough thing, right? Um, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with Matt said about people being friendly in the Midwest and wanting to help. I, I ran my first startup out of um, a Midwest state and I was amazed at how willing to help people were and it was amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's always the challenge is finding the people who have the time and, and the know-how to, to provide you those ki that kind of help. Um, I mean, networking is huge in this space uh, it's, it's huge in any space, but here it's particularly helpful. Um, you know, we've tried to help people at BBC get mentorship. We try to provide mentorship as much as we can from our own experiences running businesses and, and getting SBIRs and, and being PIs on those SBIRs and all that. So we, we try to provide what we can. Um, but if we don't have the expertise in house, you know, we try to link up with um, the tech transfer offices that we know and kind of put out some feelers in the Midwest and say, hey, you know, we have someone who, who needs someone with expertise in uh, a specific kind of cancer or, you know, they're trying to develop a medical device for this specific use. And we just try to put out some feelers to, to our tech transfer office contacts in the Midwest and say, hey, is, is there anyone you know who would be willing to help with this um, or who can provide some time? And we try to have that entrepreneur who's coming to us for help um, kind of write a little paragraph on exactly, you know, this is the expertise I need. This is the kind of you know work I might need them to do, or kind of advice I'm going to need to have, and we put that out there um, to try to get that for them. Excellent, excellent. All right, Jace. I know this is a huge platform for Unitech. How are you? How are you matching these inventors with the expertise in the field in order to get these things off the ground? So how are you doing this inventor and kind of CEO matching? Where are you finding them? Um, that's a good question. Um, there's no, there's no one answer there, and I think the best way to put it is just that Unitech. We always say that Unitech's goal is to be everywhere and nowhere, which is to say that we imagine ourselves as the hub of connect, the hub uh, that makes connections between all these disparate entities. If you come to Unitech with a um, with a design that you'd really like to get manufactured into a prototype. We know the people at UNO, uh, you know, biomechanics who can help you put that together. If you have a good idea, but you don't know how the numbers would work, we know some people at Metro or some people at UNO College of Business. Um, if you need to build a prototype, uh, you know, there's some people at Metro Community College. You know, it's just, I feel like we, we like to, to think about ourselves as um, the connector between a lot of these people. And that includes um, mentors and um, you know, people who can jump in on project and help uh, you know, make sure that the people uh, involved can kind of get some guidance from someone who might have some expertise. I think that's, we think of ourselves as connectors in that way. And in particular, <clears throat> we actually have uh, some programming aimed specifically not just at um, you know, building some of these startup ideas, but also, um, or educating on the basics of startups, but also building mentorship connections with our new Opportunity Core program that launches on Friday. Um, so there are also opportunities like that. I probably should have mentioned that before, that Unitech, you know, one way that we can help um, with mentorship and connections is also through our programs that we're developing for education to help educate um, researchers on what startups are all about or even people who want to be entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of a scattered answer to uh, the question, but I think uh, 
yeah, we just, I, I feel like we, we want to be the person mm -hmm. who knows everyone and you come to us and we'll connect you with the person you need to know. Sounds great. And then do you, would you like to use the platform to preview any of these upcoming education? I think our educational opportunities, I think there might be a lot of um, participants on the call who would be curious to know. Um, obviously, Opportunity Core is kind of finalized and launching now, um, but other programs? Well, yeah, unfortunately, we're at a, at a point where now Opportunity Core is about to happen, so it's too late for that. Keep an eye out next year. Um, on the other hand, we have a few things in development that aren't quite ready to announce. So uh, just uh, follow us on social media and you'll hear all about it. Okay. So Josh, I wanna ask, um, as you've worked with so many inventors in the whole lifespan of different technologies, what have you found has been one of the biggest apprehensions or maybe even misconceptions that kept people from taking that initial step? So I have a great idea. I really think there's a market for it, but there's something holding them back. What, what's that first thing that they kind of need to overcome and what resources can they use to overcome that? Oh man, I actually, I mean, it sounds like I work for joy. And maybe we all do actually, but I think it's, it is things like customer discovery. It's finding that first, you know, kind of customer doing the, doing, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure many people on the call or, I mean, I'm, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself have, you know, some side hustle or, or hobby or something that they do. And at some point have had the stray thought like, oh, I bet I could sell this. And then you kind of do the, the back of the napkin math to think, how many of these macrame whatevers do I need to make to actually have this be kind of worth my time? So I think there is some um, uh, 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 some things that like our office could help you with or, or others on the call could to just kind of help you think through um, uh, what does this, what, um, uh, what does this, like, what does kind of defining success, what does that need to, to look like for you? Is that, does this remain a side hustle or a hobby or does this, could this become its own thing? And how do you do that? But, you know, try and obtain that, that first customer um, and do those, you know, kind of customer interviews and, and really figure that kind of thing out. I think that that is the source of so many of the people I talk with apprehension is that it is a, it's really a cool idea objectively. I, and I have a really hard time telling you that that idea is bad because honestly bad because I honestly don't, I don't know because there are a whole bunch of things that I would say, no, I would, I would never buy that, but I'm not the target customer for it. And so me having some sort of objective determination of whether or not that thing is, is of use or not is really not my role. So the best I can do is say, this, this is the methodology I would follow to validate um, whether this concept basically holds water. And the only way you're gonna do that is to do it um, and, to give, and to give that a try. Excellent. I, I completely agree. It's, it's very interesting when you start marketing and kind of doing the initial customer discovery or marketing a technology on somebody's behalf, the things that you're so excited about and the coolest technology and the market doesn't really respond versus something you really didn't anticipate being meaningful, making a huge difference and everybody wanting it. So it's, it's interesting. And you, like you said, you don't know until you know. Well, um, that, so they, I mean, this is not innovation, but like, I think I run a really fantastic virtual trivia night you know, and uh, <laughs> then you, you get the website out there and you do the Google ad thing and you realize that like, no one wants to buy your really fantastic questions. Um, and so, uh, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't do the, you know, kind of three month Google ad experiment, spend a little money to see what are the search terms people are actually using? Is this something there's any desire for? And then I find out you can still have a really great idea. I still think my trivia night's great. But that doesn't mean I can sell it. And I think that's the part that's important. Will you be sharing a link for your trivia? <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess I could, but that's yeah, all right. Um, Jace, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Failing early 
and not being afraid to fail and recognizing failure as failure are huge things in mentoring inter, uh, innovation. Um, chances are you're not going to hit the market right on the nose on your first attempt. A lot of times you could find ways to differentiate your product, make it better, make it worth more money, make it cheaper to produce. Um, failure is not failure in innovation. It is an opportunity to pivot. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Joy, would you like to add? Biggest apprehension you see new inventors coming in with? Yeah, well, to echo what Josh said, and also Jace, thanks for jumping in about failure there. Um, I was thinking that too. I think, I don't know if everyone's aware, most startup founders do fail at least once uh, before they succeed, if not two, three, or four times. So um, if you are, if you do have those kind of aspirations, don't let failure hold you back. Um, just take what you can and learn from it and then move on to the next idea. Um, because even in failure, right, you can learn learn a lot of useful lessons. Um, yeah, apprehensions, I think I think the fear of failure, right, is a big thing. Uh, but I guess I'll kind of answer it more with the flip side of an, an attitude that can really help people to get started is an attitude of curiosity um, to just get started on kind of an innovation journey. I think that's probably the one of the, the things that can make someone really successful. And then also just an openness and a willingness to seek answers and to uh, be open to other people's input, you know, whether that input be talking to potential customers or whether it be, you know, you're at your tech transfer office and, and you're having to hear hard things <laughs> from the people there that uh, maybe you've done a ton of work on your behalf and, and research something and, and maybe it's not what you want to hear. So I think that curiosity and openness are really huge um, to help people take that first step um, and, and just get to their first success. I don't know if that really answers. And the other piece of that too, I think kind of back to what Josh was saying is um, when we don't necessarily know as the people who manage innovation, we don't know for sure. Like we can't always pick the winner of, is this gonna be a success or not? But just helping um, innovators to figure out how to communicate what is the benefit of this innovation, right? Don't get caught up on the technology. Don't get caught up on too much of the details, right? Because you're an expert in that field. But if you really want to know if something's going to work, you need to learn how to speak to an average person and, and talk about the benefit of what you're bringing um, and then figure out if that's going to match people's needs. Absolutely. All right, Matt, I've heard apprehensions about knowing your customer segment, knowing if it's going to be worthwhile, being willing to pivot. Do you have anything different? What are apprehensions that you see that keep inventors from just taking that initial step? You know, I think part of it is maybe the understanding of what we'll need to build out a team um, and the recognition of what are my personal shortcomings and how do we complement that, whether it's a first hire or finding a co-founder. Um, and a lot of that is stuff that people have said on this panel already is self-awareness. What am I not good at and how do I complement those skill sets? Self-awareness. I like it. And then finding the mentors that complement that. All right. But um, what did you anticipate, what would you like to share most with people? What's kind of an innovation, your soapbox, Megan, that you wish everybody knew before they started their innovation process? Um, what I wish everyone knew. Um, I mean, it, it's a hard process. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but I mean, coming into it, having done your homework, having done your customer discovery, recognizing, again, we, we all talked about, you know, the failure and everything, that there will be times when you're going to fail a little bit and you have to brush yourself off and go to the next thing. Um, certainly be prepared for that. Um, but, you know, you're, if you're from academia and you're running a lab or you're part of a team, you recognize that kind of what kind of work that takes. Um, so you're not brand new to this. What's brand new is the commercial part and developing a new product. Um, and you can learn that. Everybody can learn that. There, and there are lots of programs in Nebraska that can help you walk through that process uh, and get familiar with it um, so that you're not coming into it, you know, totally, totally naive to, to what you have to do. There's a lot of support out there. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of funding opportunities out there to help you get started. You know, once you really recognize what you have to do, what steps you have to get to take to get your product on the market, you can identify what are the appropriate funding sources that I need to go after. Um, and then if it's something like SBIR, um, you know, there are, there are 
people out there, including BBC, who can help you get that funding to get you on the next step. And, and it's fine if the next step tells you this isn't going to go anywhere. Maybe the technology doesn't work. And that's okay. That's not a failure. Um, it's just, again, another opportunity to learn and maybe pivot and go somewhere else. So, and that's, that's great. And all, all of those different failures and successes you have along the way are things you're going to use for your next startup, um, which will you know, have a higher likelihood of success because you're going to come in with more experience. So it's, it's hard. It's a lot of work. Um, but don't be afraid of it. Uh, you know, just do the work and the homework and research you have to do to prepare yourself as much as you can and build up the team around you to support you um, and, and help be successful. Thanks. I do. How often do you see that kind of serial inventor who gets off the ground or maybe fails on the way and then comes back and then comes back and comes back? Is this something that happens a lot in the ecosystem? Is that to me? Because it, it cut out at first. Okay. Oh, oh I'm, okay. I'm well, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that happens a lot. Um, even if in one company, you know, like SBIRs, uh, you most often don't get your SBIR on the first try. You get it on the resubmission or on the next submission, on the next submission. We, we had a company that had to submit four times to NIH to get their first award. But when they did, it was, it was a fast track for four and a half million dollars. So, you know, persistence is really key um, in the startup world. Um, brushing yourself off and getting up and trying again. Persistence is really, really key. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Jace, what's your soapbox? What, what did you wish everybody understood about innovation before they took off? I think <clears throat> it depends who, where they are, what, like, I would say that I would hope that every inventor, every researcher who's working on some sort of innovation that they're thinking about, oh, I could make a small business out of this. Think before you get so invested in doing the research, advancing the field, um, you know, learning this amazing thing. You know, you're probably a, an academic and intellectual. You really want to find the answer. You want to do this this work and figure out what the case is. However, um, the first question should be, do people want this? Do people need this? Because if they don't, stop. You're wasting your time. Unless you, this is part of your academic research that doesn't necessarily have to be commercially viable. But when it comes to commercial viability, it's not enough to just say, this would be cool. Or if I make this, people be really into it, right? There is no, if you build it, they will come in this equation. The question is, is there a market out there for this? Um, will people be excited and will they buy it? Can we create a business model that makes sense in terms of how we get people to pay for this so that it makes sense uh, to actually be making some money? Um, because there are so many uh, times I think where you know people come in with a really cool idea, we wanna develop a new drug or we want to build a new um, widget that helps people do something. And the question is really, is there a real medical need for this? Is this something that people will pay for? Um, and if the question to those things are no, great, you just saved yourself, like I was saying in chat. If the question is no, that's fantastic. You just saved yourself so much time building something no one was gonna care about. Now you can start back at square one and say, okay, what can I make that will, you know, that people will want to pay for? Um, yeah, I think I, I wish that researchers who came with um, ideas that they wanted to, for example, do SBIR, go through an accelerator, that they had thought of that themselves. And I didn't have to confront them with the, the, the uncomfortable question of who's going to buy this? Uh, because it's often something they only have only the vaguest response to because they haven't honestly thought about it. And I can't blame them, but I wish they, I wish they had, because then we'd start on the same page and we'd be, we'd be off to the races. Uh, that sounds, it sounds bad. I'm really not trying to say, I think that as an academic or a researcher, you know, your head is, is very in, much in your research. And I just, um, uh, it would be it would be great if you also could take a step back and say, do I need to make this? Okay, that's my soapbox. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I asked for it. 
Um, no, the I actually use that phrase all the time as well. The if I build it, they will come is a very um, true in academia kind of setting, but not so true in innovation. So a lot of times in working with academic inventors, just kind of making that pivot that this is a different marketplace um, than the publication and grant seeking um, spectrum. So it's it's important to bring up early. I appreciate that. Um, Josh, what what question do you love to answer? What question did you want to answer that you didn't get to today? What do people need to know? So I guess I would first push back a little bit on Jace's response, I think, because um, I think Henry Ford maybe is like commonly quoted as like, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And so I, I don't know that he's a great person to quote exactly, but like, I, I think that it's an example of like, maybe that specific application, nobody knew they, need, they didn't, a car didn't exist. So they didn't know they needed a car, but they did know that they wanted to get places more quickly. So I, I don't, so I don't know. I mean, I think that that's kind of a complicated, I, so the, the specific manifestation of that concept is maybe not what people want, but there was an underlying impulse that people were, did ultimately respond to, I guess. Um, and there's probably a debate on, you know, whether, you know, cars were probably were the solution that we should have settled on or whatever. But I mean, like, this is kind of, but I mean, that's the discussion, right? I, I, so I, I think that, yes, it's important to ask, like, is there a market for this? And it's like, oh, I don't know about this specific thing, but my research in general may be pursuing some general thrust that there is interest in um, what that final thing looks like could, you know, might be very different, you know, uh, so I don't know. I, so sorry, that's a weird answer. I apologize. Uh, I don't know, even know what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing I would say um, is serve on review panels. I think I learned so much more about the SBAR review process um, uh, or, you know, just the venture capital process or whatever by being on on the decision-making side of things. And so you can see what makes a responsive proposal, what makes a competitive proposal. That was really helpful. They're always looking for subject matter experts to do the technical review at all of these agencies. And so it's a great way to meet the program manager, get your foot in the door, maybe not that you would ever apply for an SBIR, but to have some kind of healthy working professional relationship with somebody in a position of you know power with decision making authority at those agencies whether you go for an r1 grant then ultimately or something but you kind of know how the sausage gets made and i don't think that that's ever a bad thing so that would be my kind of soapbox thing is like you don't there's not just the door i'm applicant you are decision maker i was denied three times and i'm so mad but here i am i'm going to swallow my pride and submit the fourth time great but like what could be done in the meantime that also keeps you moving forward i think that um, serving on review panels is a great way to get involved. No, that's a, that's a great answer. I'm glad that's your soapbox. Um, who is eligible to sit on these review committees and how would they do so? Well, I'm eligible, which means that almost anybody should be. <laughs> anybody else on this call would be. Um, no, you, uh, like I wrote for NSF, for example, uh, I found the project, the, the pro, uh, project manager for, the, for a specific topic area. Um, they ask for your resume. So you, you um, write an email and say, I, I, I'm interested in serving on a study section or whatever. Um, and uh, then they just kind of put you in the hopper and they'll reach out if they have, um, if they need reviewers for a certain round. I've also done USDA and it was a very similar process. Wrote the program manager and said, I'd like to serve in this capacity. And they're always looking. So um, that part's helpful. NIH probably has I would guess stronger requirements. So I've, I, you know, I, I haven't pursued that. I would imagine you need a, you know, a PhD in the hard sciences for that to be possible. Um, but you know, but that would certainly be possible for most many of the people on the call today. Great resource, Nova. Thank you. All right, Joy. What do you wish everybody knew? Well, I guess um, mine's maybe a little bit of a different angle. Uh, I'm thinking about, but it's really that anyone from any disciplinary background, 
uh, can be an innovator. Um, one of the success stories I was thinking about as I was preparing to come today was um, a team that we had go through our customer discovery program and um, did a license agreement through our office. Um, and it was a team actually from our nutrition and health sciences department. And, and they have a, a college behavioral profile um, tool that they use with college students around drug and alcohol use. And um, they ended up doing this customer discovery program and realized that this was a tool that actually could be used in a lot of other colleges and universities. And they have ended up having really quite a great impact by spreading this out across the Midwest, across a ton of other um, college campuses in Nebraska and Missouri. And, you know, because they worked with their tech transfer office and they put a license agreement in place, you know, this has then produced income to keep their program running. Whereas, you know, previously they were grant funded and, you know, that's always a little tenuous. So um, I just would encourage everyone, no matter what your background is, no matter what stage you're at as a student or faculty, um, to just be open-minded and to, to have that innovator's mindset um, that, you know, you may not think you're ready to start up your own business and that's okay. Um, but to, to look for these opportunities to get your work out into the world, um, to have impact, to move that work, you know, from the university out into the marketplace in some respect, and then just to come and talk to any of us um, to help take those first steps and, and we'll help guide you on that journey. Great. All right, guys, last question. You guys have provided a lot of resources and information. Um, a lot of programming and opportunities. How do we as employees at the university, students, staff, faculty, how do we get a hold of you and take advantage of these resources? I'll start with you, Joy. So I will just drop my, yep, I'll drop my email and a couple links in the chat and um, anyone can reach out to me if they're curious, especially about our customer discovery program. And I would love to hear from anybody. Excellent. Megan? Um, yeah, so if, if you want to get connected with BBC, you can go to our website at uh, bbcetc.com um, and you fill out a little assessment form there. Uh, at the top, there's a little tab that says work with us and you'll just provide some basic information about you and your company and what your SBIR plans are. And that'll uh, prompt one of us at, at BBC to set up a quick phone call with you and figure out where you are and what kind of help you need. And then we'll talk Excellent. about our how we work with you and contracts and everything after that. Perfect. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you guys for bringing your expertise and taking the time to go over this with us. Um, I appreciate it. As a reminder to everybody, tomorrow is our Innovations Awards at noon at 12 o'clock. Um, so you can find that link on our um, Unimed website. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day.